Most Americans and most New Yorkers would agree that with all of its problems, we enjoy one of the finest court systems in the world. A big reason for that is a man named Clarence Earl Gideon. Back in 1961, Gideon was arrested after someone saw him breaking into a pool room in his hometown of Panama City, Florida. He claimed he was innocent, but when he went to court, he couldn't afford a lawyer. A jury found him guilty, and he was sentenced to five years in jail. But Gideon was stubborn. He appealed his case all the way to the Supreme Court, this time with the help of a legal team. He argued that Florida's failure to assign him counsel violated his constitutional rights. And on March 18, 1963, the court agreed. That ruling changed the face of American justice. Today, the right of any defendant in a U.S. court to get a lawyer, whether he can pay for it or not, is unquestioned. But this year, as we mark the 50th anniversary of the Gideon decision, thousands of Americans are still denied that basic right. Today on Criminal Justice Matters, we're going to explore why. And we're very honored to have New York State Chief Judge Jonathan Lippman as our guest. Judge Lippman has been running one of the busiest judicial systems in the country since he took office three years ago. Nearly five million cases go through the New York Unified Court System every year. But he's also found time to be a forceful advocate of reform at every level, from expanding access to DNA testing to putting cameras in the courtroom. In his most recent State of the Judiciary message in February, he called for an overhaul of the bail system. Judge Lippman is a native of Manhattan, was educated in New York City public schools, and received his law degree from NYU. Judge Lippman, welcome to Criminal Justice Matters. Thank you. My pleasure. Let me start with a story. A friend of mine um, lives in Florida, was picked up on a misdemeanor case. And I asked him, well, did you get a lawyer? He ended up two days in jail. And he said, no, I would never get a lawyer. And I said, why? He said, because they're all in cahoots with the, with the judge and the judicial system. Now, that's Florida. But what, what would I tell that, that fellow about lawyers and uh, to me rights. I don't think there's anything more important to uh, making the uh, the promise of Gideon a reality than to have a competent lawyer who represents you and your uh, when your liberty interest is at stake so to me it's critical to, and the justice system is all about uh, fairness for everybody and uh, anyone who thinks that the cards are stacked against him or her in the justice system think is making a mistake. We have a system that uh, protects the rights and liberties of individuals. And I think the courts are the bulwark of that protection. So uh, I think it's essential to have a lawyer. And yet, and, and that's not to say, Steve, that our system is perfect. Yes. But I think having a lawyer is critical. Well, let me pick up on that point. I mean, despite the Sixth Amendment, which guarantees everyone the right to a lawyer, and the Gideon judgment, which says you can have a lawyer regardless of whether you right. can pay for it or not, they're still 50 years later a lot of issues that have been unsolved um, in many parts of the country, not New York State in particular, uh, and one of them being that the quality of public defenders and the, the ability of states to pay for them, since it is the states yeah. gen yes. generally give it to the county to decide yeah. how you're going to pay, I, I remains a problem. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the uh, system of indigent uh, criminal representation is uneven, to say the least. And I think that, that, again, we have to make uh, uh, the, the promise of Gideon a reality. And that's done by attention to that particular aspect of our criminal justice system. In New York, you know, we've established an indigent defense board, which I head, the chief judge heads, and an indigent defense office to address those uh, uh, particular issues, uh, making sure that in every part of the state we're meeting the constitutional requirements of Gideon. And you know, there has been a court case in New York challenging uh, uh, systemically uh, how that system runs. Uh, well, I can't talk about the case, you know. Uh, we did hear it. I wrote the majority opinion. That's Harold Herring. Uh, that's Harold Herring. Mm -hmm. But I think the bottom line is that in the end, uh, this issue has to be addressed from a policy perspective. And that's what the Indigent Defense uh, uh, Board is trying to do. We're issuing. Uh, grants on to mm -hmm. counties around the state to ensure that there is a representation at arraignment and meaningful representation to ensure that the uh, Padilla 
uh, a case and its uh, collateral consequence uh, issues are being addressed by the county. Tell so, us about that. So we, well, what we're doing is giving grants to assure that 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 every defendant, uh, uh, you know, recognizes what the the consequences are of a criminal conviction, and that the Supreme Court's uh, uh, decision in the Padilla case um, makes clear that that is a necessity. That is a requirement that you must have. So we are going to help the counties, or trying to help the counties, to meet that uh, a requirement that the Supreme Court has uh, 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 laid out. And also, again, in this broader issue of meaningful representation, mm -hmm. we are giving uh, uh, counties monies to upgrade their criminal defense system. Uh, and, and in the end, you know, I think that the, you mentioned funding is a critical issue. We fund it in New York as a county obligation, and there's certainly a question as to whether that, in the end, should be a state responsibility. Uh, you know, the counties are hard-pressed mm -hmm. in terms of money. Especially now. Yes, especially with the economy, but we're doing what we can within the existing funding structure uh, to make sure that counties get the assistance that they but need. But in the meantime, Judge Lippman, if what do we, let's put ourselves in the shoes of a public defender in yeah. upstate New York. What do you tell that public defender if he says he knows he cannot deliver a competent defense for a lot of reasons, for the systemic reasons? What should he do? I think this is his responsibility. Look, I'm not going to get into the, uh, uh, the legal aspect of what's a meaningful response. You know, there is a legal answer to that, uh, which we've uh, started to uh, address in New York. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a, it's a, the defense obligation to perform that adequate, uh, uh, meaningful, really adequate to me, although uh, people use that word, it's meaningful representation uh, that really uh, is the case. And, and I don't think there's any easy answer. One answer that we've come up uh, downstate, and we're doing it now, we're attempting to uh, take that upstate, is to reduce their caseloads. And when, well, when they come and tell us that, gee, we have too many cases, what we've done in, in, in the city is have a formula for uh, reaching that uh, uh, a case cap that, is, that will allow them to give the kind of representation we want them to give. And the court system is funding the monies needed to the legal service providers to ensure that their caseloads are reasonable and that they can perform the way that they should. So the ABA has set a reasonable caseload, as I understand it, of 250 felony cases and up to 400 misdemeanors. So if a public defender upstate comes and says, well, I've got 500 cases, I cannot deliver justice. Look, there, are, there are, again, there are legal challenges to, what the, to what's happening in the parts yeah. of the state. But I think we're making on the policy side a determined effort to ensure that those cases, we've started to uh, uh, get monies upstate to address the caseload problem. So I think the answer is you do the absolute best you, you can to meet your responsibilities as a lawyer and that that's what the court process is about. What if about you're not getting meaningful representation, there are ways to address that within the court process. That being said, we have to do everything we can as a society, as a state government, as a judiciary, to ensure that we meet our responsibilities. And to me, my responsibility is to pursue justice. This isn't about counting cases and saying so many cases in, so many cases out. We're about pursuing justice, rich and poor, high and low alike, equal justice. That's what we're about. That's what the defense community is supposed to be doing. And that's what the prosecutor is supposed to be doing. The prosecutor the of judge. all people mm -hmm. recognizes this is about the justice. And you know who the biggest advocates are for indigent defense in this state? The prosecutors. Because they get it and they understand it, that we all have this responsibility. Now that gives me a good segue in the time we have left to talk sure. about some of the other issues that you've sure. been looking forward to reform in the state. One big one is bail reform. I think the Talk bail, a little bit about the that. Bail, you said, the bail mm -hmm. system in New York is broken mm -hmm. at both ends. It's unsafe and unfair. We don't consider public safety in making bail decisions. Could you imagine that we don't get one of four states in the country that don't consider public safety? And on the other side of the equation, 
We have people because they can't produce $500 in bail, who have never been convicted of anything, who are not violent, who are not a threat to anybody, who stay in jail because they can't make $500 in bail and because a bail bondsman won't make any money by covering their $500 uh, bail. Mm -hmm. And that is not fair. They stay in. They do a bad plea bargain. They don't get justice. Their lives are ruined. Their jobs are destroyed. Their families are destroyed because you can't make $500 in bail. So at both ends of the spectrum, we're not calibrating our response to those people who come in and seek bail. And on the high end, to let violent criminals on the street, because our statutory laws do not allow judges to consider public safety, is a travesty. So on both ends, ridiculous. Now, you've issued that call in February. Yeah. How far along are we now in getting something done on that? Well, we've submitted legislation. We've gotten a lot of interest. We have sponsors that are, uh, uh, have been lined up for the bill. And I think we're getting, uh, in both houses, a lot of interest. And we need that interest and we need action because it's long overdue to change the pretrial justice system in New York and to have a system of risk-based, evidence-based assessment in terms of bail decisions and pretrial decisions. Judge Lippin, on the juvenile justice issue, New York is one of the few remaining states that hasn't raised the age the, of responsibility for young people, which means that if you are um, 16, you face a criminal record, uh, nonetheless if you get picked up by a policeman, get, get go through a court and trial. How far along are we on that? In remedy uh, I think justice? we're doing well. This is the second year of the proposal that I've made. I think it, it is getting a great deal of attention up in legislature. We have put together a coalition to get this done, and the bottom line is we are ruining the lives of 16 and 17-year-olds who act like the adolescents that they are. Adolescent brain development is different than adults, and we should not be treating 16 and 17 year olds as adult criminals because the only result is we're making them into adult criminals. And it is just so disappointing that New York of all places, a leader traditionally in juvenile justice reform, has now come down to the fact that we are one of two states in this country that treat these kids, and they are kids, as adult criminals. It's a terrible mistake, and we have to change it, and I think we're making progress toward that goal. How effective, and it brings me to ask an interesting question from my point of view, is what does a chief judge do? Your predecessor, Judith Kaye, was also a very forceful advocate of reform, as you've become. Um, aside from your legal and judicial responsibilities, is the role of a chief justice, do you think, has to be a gap flea in the system? My, Is that how you see it? My, it's not a, a, a gag plan. my constitutional mission is to foster equal justice in this state. And that is very much my role and what I should be doing. And if I'm not pursuing justice each and every day, then I'm not doing my job. It can be very tiring. <laughs> it is very <laughs> tiring. But, but well worth the effort. And whatever I can do to ensure that everyone is treated equally in this state, uh, in the justice system, that's what I'm going to do. One of the remarkable decisions you've already made um, last year was to require pro bono hours for anybody to qualify for the New York Bar. How has that gotten on with the with students and with the rest of the bar? I think, I think they're embracing it because what we want them to do, we want law students to understand the core values of our profession and the core values First and foremost is service to others. And if you want to call yourself a lawyer in New York, you're going to have to understand that that's part of what we do in our profession as lawyers, as judges. That's what we're all about. They're about justice, too. And, and part of ensuring justice is that everybody does that part in serving others, serving those people who can't necessarily help themselves. Judge Libin, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thanks, Steve. My pleasure. Reforming the public defense system isn't easy, but when experts around the country look for models of change, one office gets special mention, the Bronx Defenders. Here to tell us about it is one of the lawyers who works there, Kumar Rao. Kumar has brought with him a young man who owes his freedom today to the precedent set by the Gideon case. Damon Joe is 19, born in the Bronx. He's currently taking a semester off from studies at SUNY Delhi. But his life might have taken an entirely different course if not for the dedicated work 
of the Bronx Defenders. Kumar and Damon, thanks for coming by. Thank you. Kumar, let's, let's start with you first. Um, I understand you started out in the Wall Street law firm. That's right. And then got religion. Yeah, <laughs> something like went that. Went to uh, uh, Bronx Defenders. Tell us a bit about Bronx Defenders and why you, why you went there. Well, um, I've been at the Bronx Defenders for five years now. Um, you know, I've heard a lot about the organization before I started and uh, knew that it was sort of a unique model when it came to public defense. Um, we employ what's called holistic defense, and um, basically that means it, we are uh, community-based, client-centered, and operate in interdisciplinary teams. Okay, so let's, let's cut through, that's great, yeah. but let's cut through the jargon of right. that and say, well, what, what holistic defense means finally that you can take the entire aspect of a, of a client's case, right, rather than just look at one specific Exactly, aspect. we look right at a right client, that. not as a case, but as a client, as so their life. How does that differ from legal aid? Well, in a few ways. I mean, one is that when we look at a client, uh, we not only are able to identify the issues beyond their criminal case, for example, uh, immediately, but also have a team of advocates uh, that can assist the client and even represent them in court on their other issues that arise as a result of their arrest. For example, we have a team of immigration lawyers who can assist clients who are non-citizens. We have uh, social workers who help our clients out when they're in need of some sort of uh, you know, social support. Um, and we have civil attorneys and family attorneys so that when a client is arrested or has contact with a legal system, what's typical is that not only is there direct uh, liberty issue mm -hmm. you know, at issue, but also um, their housing, their employment, uh, they could lose their job, they could lose their children, um, they could lose their ability to live in the country. And uh, as criminal defense attorneys, that informs the way we uh, operate, informs the way we interact with our clients, and uh, it allows us to bring in as a team mm -hmm. different advocates that can assist our clients. I guess the key, uh, we were just speaking with Judge Lipman about this, is that, that the, the lawyer or the defense attorney can give maximum amount of time time that a case deserves. And you know, Damon, over to you a bit. I mean, you um, tell us a bit about your case and, and what you were able to achieve thanks to Bronx Defenders. Well, um, around 2011 summer, I was arrested allegedly for um, grand larceny, but I didn't. What was that about? Um, a little girl's chain was snatched. Somebody rode up on the bike, they snatched the chain and kept on going around the area where I live. But I, I had nothing to do with that. Um, so I was arrested for it. It was, it was an identity case. Like somebody said I did it, but when I got arrested for it, like I was pointed out. I wasn't put in the lineup or anything like that, but when I, when I was in the um, Central Bookings before I um, met the judge, I was appointed a lawyer. How old were you at the time? 16. So you were facing an adult? Yeah. Sentence, basically. Yeah. Yeah, he was facing a a felony, an e-felony, and as Judge Lipman, I know, mentioned earlier, uh, despite the fact that he was, I think, 16 or 17, he was in adult court facing felony charges, which carried upwards of uh, one and a third to four years in state prison. So was a lawyer appointed for you, or how did you get a lawyer? Oh, I didn't find them. They found me, actually. Yeah. Um, now, before I went to see the judge, um, they called me out, and there was a lawyer there waiting for me. She gave me her card. She asked me everything that happened. and. Before she left, she asked me, like, did I do it? I told her no. She said she believed me. And we went out, and I went home that day, and then I, I seen her next court date. Before every court date, she brought me into the office. We talked about what was going to happen. And this was a lawyer from Bronx Defender? Yes. And do you feel that you were lucky that you found her? Definitely. Or that she found you? Yeah. Really? <laughs> um, I, think, I think if I didn't have a lawyer, nine times out of ten, I, I probably would have been found guilty, even though I didn't do it. Why do you, why do you feel that? Why do you think that? Because with, with the lawyers at the Bronx Defenders, it's like they, they really get into it. Like, they really detail-oriented. So when, when it happened, like, I would come meet her at the office, and she would have everything that happened mapped out, like, without me even telling her. Like, she just found out the facts on her own. Like, so she would like, this happened here, this happened at this time, but they wasn't supposed to do this, and you did that. What happened after this time? Mm -hmm. So when it was time to go on trial, she just... She knew everything. She knew what to say at the right moments. She just had everything all together, and she was very organized. I mean, did you feel lucky? I mean, you know that, that under the, the Supreme Court decision 50 years ago, 
you are entitled to a lawyer regardless of whether you can pay or not. I don't know if you, you're aware of that yes. decision, which will obviously make it possible for you to get that lawyer. But do you think most friends of yours or people in your neighborhood know about that and know that they're entitled to that kind of defense? No, I don't really think they know, but now when you can't afford a lawyer, like, they just give you one, but I'm pretty sure if that wasn't the case, then it would be a lot of people who would just be in jail. I mean, have you had friends or, or, or relatives or whatever get into the situation where they, they're, 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 they're accused unjustly, but they can't get a lawyer? Yeah, several times. Really? Why? Tell us about it. Um, I have friends like my uncle, for instance. He was accused of something that he didn't do, but he was there, but somebody else did it. But they took him just because he was there. He couldn't afford a lawyer. I think he was represented by the Bronx defenders as well. So what happened to him? He got not guilty. Mm -hmm. But he was, he was in jail for like a whole six months on trial. Really? Yeah. Before he, before he got to trial? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that probably yeah. sort of goes to what you were also talking about, Judge Lippman, when it comes to bail. And that's a big issue that I know our office and our attorneys have to deal with regularly. Luckily for Damon, when he was arraigned, meaning come, came in front of the judge initially, and the judge was hearing the bail arguments, uh, certainly the prosecutors would have requested a significant amount of bail, given the fact that it was a felony. But luckily oh, for Damon, he had an attorney... Ms. Camille Bate, who mm -hmm. uh, argued for him to be released on his own recognizance without any bail. So he was able to mm -hmm. be out, go to school, while he was still fighting this case. Okay, so here, in the time we have left, uh, you have 80 lawyers, I think, in Bronx defense. Criminal defense 80 lawyers. 80 criminal defense. Now, uh, that's a lot of lawyers, but Bronx is a big place. I yeah. mean, is that enough to meet the need? I mean, are we, are we sort of chasing um, justice still because we don't have enough lawyers to help people like Damon? I think that... Uh, the number of attorneys is certainly one issue, um, but I do think that there are issues broader than uh, sheer numbers of attorneys that people in Damon's Place or other people in our community are facing as far as policing, uh, you know, the, the sheer number of arrests, the volume, the sort of arrests people are getting uh, charged with, and then the process in which people are being dragged through the judicial system. Mm -hmm. People have to wait uh, months, if not years, to see their case go to trial. Um, and whether they're in jail or out of jail, I mean, that has real impacts on people's lives and their families. Um, again, for, for Damon, uh, I think his case pended about a year and a half, which um, is actually fairly short for, for the Bronx. And mm -hmm. what's particularly, I think, lucky for him, again, is that uh, a judge agreed to have him released on his own recognizance and not have to pay bail. I'm not sure his family would have been able to afford the kind of bail that the DAs would have been asking for. Mm -hmm. And had he been in jail during the time of his trial, mm -hmm. um, he would not have been able to go to college. Okay, quick question for each you. One word answer. Equal justice still possible in the Bronx? Yes or no? Uh, possible, but not without serious uh, policing reforms and reforms to the courts. David? I agree. Thank you both. Thank you. Great having you. American justice has come a long way in the last 50 years. Thanks to Gideon and the work of thousands of public defense attorneys like those who work at the Bronx Defenders, the amount of money you have doesn't necessarily determine whether you get a proper trial. But it's also clear that the system which Gideon helped bring about is badly in need of repair. Fixing it is essential if we want to live up to our own constitutional promise of equal justice for all. I'm Steve Handelman. Thanks for watching. See you next time.